What is up guys? I'm back with another video and today we're going to be looking at antiplatelet drugs. So because I just covered a lot of videos uh, going back to hematology, I wanted to cover a little bit more of pharmacology with what I started with when I started this YouTube channel. So because it applies to hematology, I went into the kind of some of the drugs uh, within the unit of hematology and we're going to begin with antiplatelet drugs. So let's move right into this. These are the types of antiplatelet drugs. So there's NSAIDs, and you know that they um, act on the cyclox oxygenase uh, section of the arachidonic uh, acid pathway, and there's reversible and irreversible types within that. There's P2Y12 receptor blockers. There's reversible and irreversible within that. PDE3 inhibitors, that just stands for phosphodiesterase 3 inhibitors. And then GP2B3A, that's just glycoprotein 2B3A. There is a receptor that that basically GP2B3A is involved with platelet aggregation and that's how platelets can aggregate and they aggregate via that cross-linking with fibrinogen and so there's GP2B3A inhibitors and there's reversible and irreversible within that as well. So let's move right into this. I'm not going to spend much time on NSAIDs because I'm sure it's been drilled into your head all through med school or whatever professional school you're in. I am going to cover though some of the important details that you need to know and I'm going to present the platelet life within this on, on this particular slide because it's really important when it comes to questions for some of this. So the platelet life, the average life of platelets, how long, basically how long does a platelet live? It lives for about seven days. That's going to become really important because if you're taking a drug such as an NSAID, um, it's going to be very important whether the NSAID you're taking is irreversible or reversible. The reason being is because if you were to be, uh, if you were going to be having a surgery coming up and you were already taking aspirin for say some cardiac issue or something like that or to thin your blood, uh, you're going to have to be off of the aspirin for seven days. The reason is, the, and the reason for that is because aspirin is irreversible. It's an irreversible cyclooxygenase one and two inhibitor. And that's really important because because it's irreversible, it can't let go of the cyclooxygenase um, in the pathway. So therefore, it is going to be bound for the life of the platelet. So when you stop taking aspirin, you have to let all of those platelets die off and new platelets form before you can go into surgery or you could have uh, surgery complications of bleeding but, uh, during the surgery or even after. Okay, so that's just a very high yield side note. The platelet life is seven days. Remember that. The mechanism of action of NSAIDs is just, it's just like I said, and I'm going to kind of reiterate what happens here. So I don't know if, I hope you've heard of the arachidonic acid pathway. So we have something called arachidonic acid, which is kind of the main substrate that helps in um, whenever inflammation happens in the body. And what happens is this arachidonic acid is formed from the phospholipid membrane. Uh, it's pulled from it using something called phospholipase A2, PLA2. So you pull using phospholipase A2 and you form this thing called arach arachidonic acid. And then it can go into two things depending on the enzyme and depending on how it's activated and whatnot. You can go into the COX pathway or the cyclooxygenase pathway and there's uh, subunits 1 and 2 for that. And then when you do that, you're going to get thromboxane A2 and prostaglandins. And they both have various functions we'll talk about in a second. And then if you could also go to the other pathway using something called LOX as a nickname. That's just lipooxygenase. Oxygenase. And if you use LOX, then you can get things like leukotrienes and whatnot. And uh, some of the leukotrienes are used for neutrophil, margin, uh, neutrophil um, margination. Basically, not margination, I'm sorry, neutrophil chemotaxis. So LTB4. I think the way I remember that is, so if we're talking about LTB4 specifically, I think of B for brings in the neutrophils. So neutrophil chemotaxis is done with leukotrienes. Some of the other leukotrienes are involved with allergic reactions and allergy and whatnot and asthmatic responses. And then thromboxin A2 and prostaglandins are kind of used in terms of vasodilation, capillary permeability, and involved with uh, just the inflammatory response. So, I said all that to say that these NSAIDs act on this enzyme, cyclooxygenase 1 and 2. Now, it's important that it's not enough to just know that. You need to know some of the primary NSAIDs, which I'm sure you know most of. I put the main ones here that most of the time tests will mention. Ibuprofen, indomethacin, uh, celecoxib. So, those are kind of the three main um, NSAIDs. Those are reversible. That's extremely important. These are reversible versus aspirin, which everybody knows about. You have to remember that aspirin 
is a cyclooxygenase inhibitor, but it is irreversible. And what does it inhibit? It doesn't just inhibit cyclooxygenase 1 or cyclooxygenase 2. It inhibits both, just like the reversible one. So know that as well. All right, so that covers aspirin, endomethacin. What are the, some of the side effects? Well, I'm sure you know a lot of this already too. Of course, bleeding. If you're turning the platelets off, you can't clot your blood, you're going to have bleeding. You're going to see that as a trend in all of these drugs. Bleeding is a side effect in every single one of these drugs. So I won't reiterate much more other than that, that one, now that I've just mentioned it. So the side effects for the reversible versus the irreversible. The reversible, which is all of them except for aspirin, you can get gastric ulcers. You should already know that. That's been drilled into uh, med students' heads that NSAIDs, um, all NSAIDs cause, can cause gastric ulcers when you take them in high intake. So gastric ulcers is one. And then the other thing, obviously, I said is bleeding. So that's pretty straightforward. Some of the more important and high yield side effects comes under aspirin, which is the irreversible COX-1 and 2 inhibitor. This, of course, can cause gastric ulcers and bleeding, like I said, but these two are really high yield. Rye syndrome and tinnitus. Tinnitus just means a ringing sensation in your ears. That can happen with high dose of aspirin along with Rye syndrome. Rye syndrome is when... Uh, is when children take aspirin. Children are, first of all, never supposed to take aspirin, especially when you have a febrile infection or, or something that you're predicting to be viral. So what can happen is you can end up with hepatic encephalopathy and fatty liver, and it can be life-threatening. So that's just, that's so if, if you have a test question where they're mentioning that a seven-year-old kid, you know, took, you know, felt bad, popped, you know, had, had a fever, and then, for, you know, for the last couple of days, and then it's, the mother says they took some over-the-counter drug, all of a sudden they have fatty liver and hepatic encephalopathy symptoms. You need to really be thinking of Rye syndrome. So you never give children uh, aspirin with febrile illnesses, okay? So you really don't want to give aspirin to children, period, because um, some certain rare types of viral illnesses and whatnot don't have a fever associated. So you may think, oh, well, then I can give it. Well, no, you shouldn't. Okay, the uses. So the uses are a kind of, NSAIDs have tons of uses. So I'm not going to focus too much on this. Just know they can be used in myo myocardial infarction or heart attack in acute situations where they present with a current heart attack, uh, prevention of heart attacks. Many patients are on aspirin for prevention of heart attacks. Acute stroke you give them and you can give them for stroke prevention to maybe stop after a stroke. Maybe you had a stroke because you have some sort of um uh, plaque buildup on your the chambers of your heart and so maybe that you know if you know about anything about the mitral valve you know that when it gets plaques or vegetations on it they can break off especially in situations of high blood pressure and you can cause an atrial fibrillation from uh, the blood backing up say from something called mitral stenosis and when the left atrium stretches really large you can actually go into arrhythmias and then you can throw plaques off because of all the blood stasis that is collecting within the left atrium that can go to your brain or various parts of the body and if it goes to the brain it can cause a stroke so I said all that to say that's why aspirin can be used or NSAIDs can be used in, in acute stroke and stroke prevention. Okay, so I didn't want to spend too much time on that, but I did want to mention some of the high yields. What are the high yields? Aspirin causes tinnitus or ringing in the ears as a side effect. It causes rise syndrome, so you never want to give it to kids. The platelet life is seven days, so you need to know that because irreversible uh, COX-1 and 2 inhibition, like with aspirin, you want to make sure that if a patient is taking aspirin, they have not been taking aspirin for seven days prior to the surgery. That's really high yield, and then just know some of these high yield and said names. Okay, so now let's get into the actual meat of this PowerPoint. You know how I love uh, mnemonics. If you watch a lot of my videos, I always use mnemonics and we're going to use mnemonics through all of this as well. The first one is P2Y12 receptor blockers. Now here's the general definition right here. A P2Y12 receptor binds ADP to activate platelets for aggregation. Okay, so you know that ADP is needed in the platelet, so I'm going to take you a briefly, quickly through kind of what happens. Platelet, there's something called platelet adhesion. It's when you have an initial, uh, uh, like the initial injury of a blood vessel. Say you have a blood vessel and you've got a stab wound. The blood vessel is open. The initial thing that happens first is constriction, neural constriction. You can also have constriction through something called endothelin as well. So you could basically, you would just have constriction. The first thing is you're, you're going to have a reflex constriction of that vessel when you have an injury. The next thing is that you're going to have something called platelet adhesion. Platelet adhesion. Platelet adhesion is just the part that uses von Willebrand factor to help clog up all these platelets in this area and block the initial injury so you stop bleeding. After that, 
you're going to have some of the other now you after that you need to expand this a little bit to kind of have a better coverage of this injury so then you're going to use um, ADP is one of them I'm not going to go into too much detail another one is going to be thrombox and a2 but ADP which is the thing of focus here ADP is responsible for activating what's called the activation of a platelet and when it's activated it helps to put GP2B3A receptor on the surface of a platelet and that receptor binds fibrinogen and fibrinogen binds from both sides and links two platelets together both of the two GP2B3A how does it do that? Because ADP helps activate the platelet. And this is called platelet aggregation. That is extremely high yield. You'll see a lot of QBank questions in test books where they're going to ask you, they're going to describe maybe von Willebrand factor being used. Then you know, oh, this is referring to platelet adhesion. Uh, maybe ADP and thromboxane A2, they'll, or they'll mention uh, GP2B3A, that's platelet aggregation. So make sure you keep that straight. And then the very first thing that happens before any platelets get to the scene is reflex constriction using endothelin and a neural reflex. That's the very first thing that happens in a vascular injury. So that's very high yield as well. I said all that to say that we're talking now in this particular drug class about ADP. So PTY12 receptor binds that ADP. So before the ADP can activate the platelet and help express GP2B3A, which will bind this fibrinogen in the middle to cross-link two platelet molecules, you need to be able to activate the platelet. Now the platelet can only be activated because of PTY12 binding the ADP to activate the platelet. Now that tells us that we can then stop, that we can stop this platelet aggregation and platelet activation from happening by inhibiting PTY12. So, okay, what is the mnemonic for this, for the drugs? Because the drugs are really big words, it's wordy. I'm sure you've all heard of clopidogrel, but you oftentimes it is kind of easy to forget what the that the fact that this is a PTY12 receptor blocker. Here's what I say. There's a movie called Monty Python. Monty Python and the Holy Grail. It's a comedy movie, it's very famous, um, and it has a lot of literary elements, which is why I actually watched this in high school and we ended up writing an essay on some of the literary elements, but that's besides the point. It's a very famous um, comedy movie that's shown all over the U.S., and um, in this, I want you to notice a couple things. You're, you're probably wondering, how is this going to be useful? When you look at P2Y12, there's a bunch of numbers. You can pretty much ignore those. I want you to notice there's a P and there's a Y. So PY should indicate you towards Python. And if you can remember that, then you know, oh, okay, anytime I see P2Y12, that helps me you remember, oh, this is the, that's going to spark your memory, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. I'm saying that because really you can pronounce it Grail or Grail, either one. Because look at these words. Ticagrelel, Grail, Clopidogrel. That's the main one right there, clopidogrel, very high yield, P2Y12 receptor. Now, if you have those two, the only thing left to memorize is diclopidine. Okay, so that mnemonic gets you the two main drugs within this category. The ticagrelor and the clopidogrel are very high yield. Ticlopidine as well. But it's important also to know which one's reversible and which ones aren't. Clopidogrel and ticlopidine is irreversible. You have to remember that. Irreversible. Ticlopidine, clopidogrel, irreversible. The way I remember that is because clopidogrel is used far more often than ticlopidine and ticagrelor. So I, I often think that the doctor would want to use the most potent, best acting, strongest drug. So clopidogrel has to be within the irreversible P2Y12 blockers. Okay, because that's the best acting one along with ticlopidine. All right, then how do you remember of these three, which one's going to be the reversible then? Because if you can remember which one's reversible, you know the other two then have to be the irreversible. All right, so how do I remember that? Because of all of these, the only one that ends with an R whether it be beginning with an R or ends with an R, the only one that ends with an R is ticagrelor. Sorry, it's a hard word to pronounce. Ticagrelor. So that's the only one that ends with an R. Therefore, it is reversible. Ends with an R, reversible. R for reversible. And clopidogrel, so you'll be able to get the, the reversible P2Y12 blocker because you know it ends with an R. And then the irreversible, you should be able to get right off the bat clopidogrel because you know that doctors always use clopidogrel, kind of the most used of this category. It's also the most showing up on QBank questions. So that should spark your memory that doctors want to use the best 
best acting drug in this particular case. So clopidogrel should remind you, oh yeah, that should be the really strong acting one. Therefore, it is an irreversible PTY12 blocker. Thus, it will act the entire length of the platelet life cycle, which is, what is it again? It's seven days. Remember that, seven days. Okay, now the side effects. I, sa I said it was important. Let me clear all this because I've explained all this already. I've already told you that we've talked about the reversible and the irreversible. And you're probably thinking, is it that important to remember which one's reversible and irreversible? It is because of what I mentioned, the platelet life, and also because the side effects differ. And there's a unique side effect that only the reversible one primarily has that is most common in Tacagrelor. And that is dyspnea and bleed, uh, bleeding. How do you, now, the R is going to come in handy again. I said R is for reversible. R should also help you remember respiratory problems. This is very unique to, to this drug class and to a lot of these drugs. Now, you're going to expect bleeding. You're going to expect bleeding. It's in both. But dyspnea and a difficulty breathing, that is unique primarily to tacagrelor. How do we remember that? Because it ends with an R. It's the only one that ends with an R. Thus, it is R for reversible and R for respiratory problems, tacagrelor. Remember that. All right, so that covers both of those. What are the uses? Dual platelet therapy for MI. That's fairly high yield because oftentimes when a patient had an MI, you typically don't give just aspirin by itself. It's usually kind of accompanied um, at times with one of these PTY12 uh, receptor blockers. These are used fairly often, especially clopidogrel. And then the other really important thing to know is that Whenever you have, if they, this is in a lot of test questions too. Whenever you have a patient who's, who is allergic to aspirin, typically you jump to this category. This is the category you would typically jump to, okay? So in patients that are allergic to aspirin and they can't have aspirin, but they need something that acts like aspirin, you give a PTY12 receptor blocker. Typically the answer would be clopidogrel. If they're trying to be tricky, they'll give you one of the other two. Let me remind you of the mnemonic. Monty Python and the Holy Grail. That kind of gets our initial information that we need to answer this. Monty Python and the Holy Grail, or Grell, pronounce it like that, Grell. So this is important, this is important. If you can look, and if you have a test question, and they're saying something about PTY12 receptor, just try to get Python out of P and Y. The rest are just numbers, right? The rest are just numbers. You should be able to recognize this because you know there's a P, a Y, and a bunch of numbers. They're not going to give you on a multiple choice question a bunch of P, you know, a bunch of PY and then a bunch of random other numbers and try to get you wrong that way. It's just going to be you need to recognize P, Y, and then know there's some numbers, okay? So P, Y stands for the Python, and then that should help you remember, oh, yeah, that famous comedy movie and the Holy Grail. Grell for Grell. That is in Takag Grell lore, Clopido Grell, the two really high yield ones. Okay, and now that you have Takagra lore, you look at the end of it, you're like, oh, that's the only one with an R on the end. It, it, you know, toward the beginning or the end. It's the only one with an R. What is that R for? Respiratory problems, and this is the reversible one. That's very high yield. This is the reversible P2Y12 receptor. Okay, so the mnemonic tells us the, ca the mechanism of action, basically, you just have to remember then that P uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail is, is what is its actual function after you know it's a P2Y12 receptor. Then you need to know that it's responsible for binding the ADP to activate platelets for platelet aggregation. Okay. All right. So let's move on to the next one. The next one is PDE3 inhibitors. Again, I have a mnemonic again for this. This one should probably spark your memory because it's it's also used in that kind that pathway with nitric oxide and you know the whole conversion of uh, CGMP and whatnot the GMP and all that stuff and it's basically going to result with vasodilation so you can use this drug to help kind of cause vasodilation and then it helps with erectile dysfunction and whatnot with sildenafil being a PDE inhibitor, except that one is not a PDE3 inhibitor, it is a PDE5 inhibitor. I've seen questions on that too. And I'm going to give you kind of a clever mnemonic at the end of this to help distinguish that as well, because they will, they actually will put a question that will give you PDE3 and PDE5. I've seen it before, and I'm going to show you how to distinguish the two. So, what does PDE3 do as far as to platelets? We know it does things to vascular smooth muscle and all that. What does it do to platelets? It converts CAMP, 
to AMP in platelets. Now this is very similar to the mechanism of action involved with vascular smooth muscle with the treatment of PDE5 inhibitors in erectile dysfunction. But except in erectile dysfunction, it does the conversion of CGMP to GMP. So it's a little different. Okay, now that's the normal function of PDE3. So if you inhibit that, what do you end up getting a buildup of? You end up getting a buildup of CAMP. Now, this is important to know. CAMP has an inverse relationship to platelet activation. It's a complex reason why I've read papers and stuff on it. I really don't fully understand it. Just know that. CAMP has an inverse relationship to platelet activation. Now, this is not the reason why, but I'll tell you how it kind of helps me to remember this. I'm going to walk you through a situation where a patient had a vascular injury. Let's say there was a knife they got cut, I don't know, paper cut or something, right? So they've opened up the small little vessels on the surface of the skin. So there's damage right here, and here's the subendothelial area. Subendothelial area. So initially what happens when you have an injury, I said the first thing is going to be vasoconstriction, right? And that's reflex mediated along with endothelin mediated vasoconstriction. That's the first thing that happens. The very next thing that happens is platelets go to the site and block it. They do this by binding with von Willebrand factor. Remember I said that. So and that whole process is called platelet, platelet adhesion. That's called platelet adhesion. Now, if, if platelets are binding, if platelets are basically blocking an injured site, you imagine that you're not at the norm, right? If platelets are being called into a situation, it means we are not operating normally. We are trying to fix some sort of injury. Therefore, remember that CAMP is often used to activate various things in a cell. But yet I want you to keep in mind that when platelets are activated, things are not normal. They're the opposite of normal. They're bad. Therefore, CAMP in that situation has an inverse relationship to platelet activation. We are not in the norm. We're not just normally activating CAMP to cause various signal transduction pathways to occur. In, in situations of platelet activation, CAMP has an inverse relationship. That means decreased CAMP actually activates the platelet. You have damage, right? Platelets are going to the site. Therefore, you are not in a situation of norm where CAMP would be activating it. Therefore, in platelet situations where they're working, you would have a low level of CAMP. Okay? So that's the first, that's the clever trick that I use to kind of remember it. The next thing, this is high yield. Diesterase. This is how I remember the stuff that's involved within PDE3 inhibitors. Diesterase. Die. Someone dies. Right? Let me clear all this. It's kind of in the way. Someone dies. That's kind of what I think when I see diesterase. So you die from the amp, not the volt. If you remember, I don't know if you've ever done something stupid like this I have before. You have a plug outlet and you put your finger in there. When I was a little kid, I did that. T typically, you will be okay. But you have to remember, if they up the amps, that's actually the thing that will throw your heart off and kill you, not the voltage. So you die from the amp, not the volt. The, all you need is a very small increase in amps to kill you. It takes a ton of volts, way higher volts to kill you. So you die from the amp, not the volt. How is that useful? Because diesterase equals CAMP. We know that PDE3 inhibitors are messing with the diesterase because you die from the amp. Now, let's look at the drugs. It applies diperidamol. Die. That'll help you get one of them. Silostazole, pronounce it kilostazole because you are killed. Die is the same thing as being killed, right? Kilostazole. Those are the two uh, primary drugs that we're going to cover here. There's some other ones, but they're not as applicable to platelet, um, as to platelet activation per se. All right, so let's get into the mechanism of action. I've given you the mnemonic to help you there. The mechanism of action, diperidamol is a PDE3 inhibitor. I said that. I said you can remember that because DI stands for die, but it also has a unique mechanism of action that Salastazole does not have in that it causes adenosine uptake to be inhibited. Remember adenosine? Adenosine causes vasodilation. Adenosine causes vasodilation. Now, typically this the amount of vasodilation is controlled because adenosine can be uptaken by various cells. This drug will inhibit that uptake along with being a PDE3 inhibitor. That will cause vasodilation, correct? Correct. 
All right, then, so the mechanism, so that covers this one. The next one is celastazole or kilostazole, like I said. It's a PDE3 inhibitor as well, but it also has a unique function that dipritamol does not have. It's a vascular smooth muscle dilator. Vascular smooth muscle dilator. Now, before, adenosine is just kind of floating all around in the blood and it's vasodilating everything. In this particular example, it's targeting specifically vascular smooth muscle. Vascular smooth muscle. That's going to be very important when you look at the use. Okay, so those are the two mechanisms of action of uh, dipritamol and celastazole or kilostazole. What are the side effects? The side effects, the side effects are going to be exactly what you would assume they would be. When you vasodilate all your blood vessels, when you vasodilate all your blood vessels, vasodilation is a proposed theory for headaches. You would think, I remember when I was studying this, I always assumed vasoconstriction would be, but actually this contractile going from constriction to vasodilation is what causes headache. So vasodilation can cause headaches. It would cause flushing. That just means you look red in the face or you look red on your body. Why would you look red? Because when you vasodilate all your all your blood vessels, all the blood rushes from other areas of the body to the blood vessel. Therefore, you're, you're filled with blood towards the surface of the skin and you look red. Flushing occurs. And then low blood pressure. How is blood pressure maintained? Blood pressure is just if you cram a ton of amount of blood into a tiny blood vessel, you have really high blood pressure, right? If you dilate all the blood vessels, now all of a sudden there's the same amount of blood as you had, but the blood the vessels are bigger. So now there's all this space here where the blood isn't. It's just kind of pooling. That's going to cause uh, low blood pressure. So what are the side effects? They all make sense. Hi um, headache, flushing, and hypotension, okay? Last one, important to know, you can have arrhythmias with PDE3 inhibitors. That's just something you have to remember. But typically, it kind of, that should make sense as well. Let me take you through what happens. You have a heart, right? It's the same thing. It's going through the chambers. You have your right atrium, your right ventricle, your right ventricle, your left atrium, and your left ventricle, right? What t remember what I said about the left atrium earlier. I said that when blood collects and just sits in the left atrium, whether it be to a mitral stenosis right here, where blood cannot get through, so blood sits, or if you have a dilation of all your vascular smooth muscle in your vascular, your vascular system, that means that blood is going to begin to pull everywhere, and it can begin to back up into the heart. When blood backs up into the heart, it will pull in the left atrium, and when it pulls into the left atrium, because the blood pressure just it isn't just enough to shoot it out here, you can have arrhythmia because you can go into uh, atrial fibrillation when blood stretches out that left atrium or just sits in the left atrium. Okay, so that should kind of intuitively make sense and you can get to it kind of by thinking it that way. What are the uses? Dipritamol. Now, this is why it was important up here to know, let me clear all this, to know the unique mechanisms of action. The fact that this is a unique mechanism of action to dipritamol as a denosine uptake inhibitor, the unique mechanism of action of celastazole or kilostazole, like our mnemonic says, vascular smooth muscle dilator. This is important because dipritamol is used in cardiac stress testing whenever, typically in a cardiac stress test, you tell a patient to get on a treadmill and keep running and keep running because you're trying to stress the heart and then you're looking at the EKG or an echo whatever it may be to see if the defect is only present uh, when you stress the heart when it has to work hard some patients can't get on a treadmill treadmill or do exercise they just don't have the physique to do it maybe they're too obese or they are in a uh, wheelchair or whatever so in those patients you would need to do a cardiac stress test and you can use dipritamol you can use dipritamol because you have to vasodilate all the areas of the body including the heart when you vasodilate, how is it doing it? Because adenosine is not being uptaken and adenosine is sitting all over in your blood and it's vasodilating everything. Therefore, it is helpful in cardiac stress tests to kind of get you worked up a little bit. It kind of pushes you up a little bit as far as in your response to your heart. It makes, the reason it makes, it makes you, the reason it stresses your heart is because when you vasodilate everything, the blood pressure goes down your heart will react by increasing heart rate to try to maintain the, the cardiac output. Because if it's just blood pooling and just sitting in the heart, you will die eventually from ischemia to various organs. So it has to increase the heart rate to make up for this decrease in blood pressure. That's why the, this works in a cardiac stress test. And then, of course, dual platelet drug stroke prevention, specifically stroke prevention. That's a little bit lower yield, though. 
Uh, Celastazole, it's used in peripheral arterial disease. That's really important. Why does this, why is this one used in peripheral arterial disease and not dipritamol? Because I said the unique mechanism of action of celastazole is a vascular smooth muscle dilator. Remember in peripheral arterial disease, you're having blockage of arteries and it typically happens in the lower limbs where all of your calf muscles and various muscles of the legs are. So if you do a vascular smooth muscle dilator, you will help with their intermittent claudication and all the symptoms that they could have from peripheral arterial disease. Okay, so that's PDE3 inhibitors. The last one we're going to talk about is GP2B3A blockers. It's just a complex name for the glycoprotein receptor. Once once ADP has activated the platelet, this causes GP2B3A to uh, basically be expressed on the surface of platelets. That then allows fibrinogen to cross-link platelet molecules. And so that's how this whole thing is going to be happening here. So this is kind of one step after ADP, like the one we talked about in one of the other drug classes we discussed. So GP2B3A receptor is used to link platelet to each other in aggregation, aggregation, not adhesion. Remember, adhesion is the initial step after vasoconstriction, that reflex vasoconstriction. And it's, and it's linking these together using that GP2B3 molecule with fibrinogen. So fibrinogen is the actual thing that, that connects to the GP2B3A on each side and links the platelets. So what is the mechanism of action? The mechanism of action is going to be or again, this is kind of similar in each situation except for one of them is an antibody, okay? So the first one, abcixamab, abcixamab, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Look at the beginning of it. I, I put it in the same color. AB, AB for antibody. This one acts as an antibody against the GP2B3A to stop cross-linking. Antibody, the C4 cross-linking. That should help you remember when you look at abcixamab, think of AB, okay, this is an antibody, and then the C right after it should help you remember, oh yeah, this is the antibody that is involved in stopping cross-linking. Cross-linking of platelets is just the fibrinogen that we talked about and the GP2B3A on each side with the platelet to cross-link the platelet. So that should help you remember, oh yeah, that's a GP2B3A blocker. And then the next two, um, very difficult to remember. I would just keep reading it and practicing it and getting used to seeing this. This is, this is really difficult to remember for me. I couldn't think of a strategy to remember these two. If you have a strategy to remember these two drugs, please put it in the comment section, but I couldn't think of anything. These are GP23A just flat blockers. They're not, they don't use an, an it's not an antibody against the cross-linking like abcixamab is. Okay. So the title of these is eptifabatide and terofabam. Okay. Those are the two drugs. Just, Practice. Keep reading them over and over and try to get used to them being in this category. Side effects. This is very high yield. GP2B3A blockers. A side effect that is very prominent in this category is thrombocytopenia. What does that mean? That just means decreased platelet count. You never give this, you never give these drugs to a patient with low platelets. If they are already in a state of thrombocytopenia from whatever reason, you do not give this drug because it will send their platelets even lower and then they will begin to uh, go basically internally bleed and can die. And even when you give the drug in a patient who had normal platelets, you have to monitor after being given because it can cause them to go into thrombocytopenia. What's the solution when they go into thrombocytopenia? Discontinue the drug. And then, of course, like I said always, bleeding is always a side effect. What are the uses? The uses is very few. Because of this problem with this side effect, it's kind of in patients with refractory problems, hospital setting, and all these drugs are IV only. Okay? So that covers all of the important points of antiplatelet drugs. I hope these mnemonics helped you. I always try to supply some sort of mnemonic in every one of my videos because medicine has a lot of information and it can get overwhelming. If this helped you, Please like, subscribe, share the video to your friends. I will catch you in another video. Bye, guys.